Six. Four. Three. Two. One. And lift off of Space Shuttle Atlantis. A final visit to enhance the vision of Hubble into the deepest grandeur of our universe. The Hubble Space Telescope is one of a suite of great observatories developed by NASA. So there's the Chandra X-ray Observatory that was uh, launched on SDS-93. The Hubble Space Telescope is one of the most well-known, largely because it images in visible light. So it shows us what we would see in many ways if we, with naked eye, could see with that kind of magnification and that, that kind of a distance. And I think in that way, it really has captured the public imagination because those images that have come back are so extraordinary, but there's also some sense that we've built a magnifier of what, in a very adjusted kind of way, we would potentially be able to see in space. So it was flown by the Space Shuttle Discovery which is at the National Air and Space Museum at our Stephen F. Hood for Hazi Center. And notably, that was designed as an instrument that would be human-tended. So it has handholds built into the side of the telescope. And there was a whole series of shuttle missions that were flown to bring new instruments up. So it's a little bit like having a car, but you've switched out the engine, you've moved from an eight track to a tape deck, to a CD, to having very good satellite radio in it. Each time they were going up to the Hubble Space Telescope, they were putting new instruments on and making adjustments to the instruments. So the Hubble Space Telescope that still exists today is in many ways a housing for other instruments that have been brought up to uh, upgrade what the capability was. So it is extraordinary that it has really been going for these 33 years now. The launches that begin the International Space Station happened in the year 2000. The history goes back before that. We talked about the Soviets having space stations, the U.S. had the Skylabs, the U.S. had been planning to create their own space station. The U.S. space station was going to be called Space Station Freedom. And what really happens is the end of the Cold War. And in the 1990s, as the Soviet Union has broken up and has become the Russian Federation and the different individual states, there begins to be cooperation politically and then technologically between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And they're starting in 1993 are these agreements that are written up for figuring out how we could fly in space jointly. And so the ISS really begins with the first crew going to the ISS in the late fall of the year 2000. And so that's a date that those in the space community are always noting because it means it's one more year that we've had this uh, continual steady occupation of a station in Earth orbit. January 16th, 2003. The Space Shuttle Columbia launches from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It is NASA's 113th Space Shuttle program flight. The flight spends over 15 days in orbit. On Saturday, February 1st, Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrates upon re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere over Texas and Louisiana killing all seven astronauts on board. The accident was determined by NASA's Columbia Accident Investigation Board to have been caused by a piece of foam breaking off during launch, damaging the thermal protection system on the orbiter's left wing. The crew of the shuttle Columbia did not return safely to Earth, yet we can pray that all are safely home.
cause in which they died will continue. Mankind is led into the darkness beyond our world by the inspiration of discovery and the longing to understand. Our journey into space will go on. So the return to flight mission that was flown in 2005 really begins the era of the final space shuttle flights that happened between 2005 and the end of that program with the retirement of the space shuttle orbiters in 2011. Eileen Collins, a very experienced pilot and commander, is the commander of that mission. It has seven astronauts on board and I think it's indicative. It's a blend of men and women, including international astronauts. And with the final years of the space shuttle program, you really see solidified the international collaborations being done with the U.S. vehicle, but also then as a part of the support of the International Space Station, because that really becomes the mission of the final years of the space shuttle is to bring up the equipment, the supplies, and then also to do the work of the final construction of the International Space Station. Costing 75 million, Branson aims to have his first spaceship, VSS Enterprise, in operation by 2007. Only then will we know if he's boldly gone where no investor has gone before. Before you get to the events of 2010, when Virgin Galactic has the first successful crew glide flight of their vehicle, the VSS Enterprise, you have the events of the X Prize. The X Prize was a prize created by Peter Dumandis. The X was supposed to be a placeholder. He was going to get a big commercial sponsor at some point, and it would be the something prize. And the X was going to be a placeholder for that. In the end, it sounds futuristic, and they kept it. And so even when it was funded, it was known as the Ansari X Prize. X Prize was modeled on the Ortig Prize and other kinds of money prizes that were incentives for achievements in flight. So when Charles Lindbergh becomes the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic in 1927, he's trying to win the Ortigue Prize, which was a money prize put up by a hotelier to promote aviation. And by specifically saying, if you have to be able to fly from a major city to a major city across the Atlantic. And so New York to Paris becomes the goal. Peter Diamandis read about Charles Lindbergh and came away with the inspiration that he should create a similar prize that would get people interested in these kinds of spaceflight challenges. So Spaceship One in 2003 wins the Ansari X Prize, which is a money prize for a privately constructed and funded spaceship that would be able to go repeatedly into space two times within a short amount of time carrying the weight of the equivalent of three different people and so it is that project spaceship one that then becomes the basis for this new branch of the virgin company virgin records virgin atlantic virgin galactic and virgin galactic is the branch of the company founded by Richard Branson, a private company that's interested in selling tickets for suborbital space flights. And launch of the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket as NASA turns to the private sector to resupply the International Space Station. The first flight of the Dragon to resupply the International Space Station, Dragon being a vehicle created by SpaceX, really is an important landmark that has a longer history. So in 2006, NASA actually starts a program called the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, or COTS, C-O-T-S. And the idea is to incentivize companies to create the capacity to bring first cargo and then crew to the International Space Station. And the idea was 
that they would be interested in having private companies doing the kind of regular work of supplying and transporting human space flight and that that would allow NASA then to get back to its real work of innovation and exploration and moving on to new things such as the Artemis program which is aiming to put human beings back on the moon for the first time since 1972. So this landmark in 2012 of the SpaceX Dragon mission to the ISS really has its roots in that turn that happens beginning in 2006 to bring cargo back and forth to the ISS as well as crew using commercial space flight, not necessarily something that would be entirely government funded and created. The James Webb Space Telescope is a really remarkable piece of technology uh, for a few different reasons. It is not designed to be human tended like the Hubble Space Telescope was, so it needs to work. From the time it's launched, it needs to work perfectly. It cannot be reached to be fixed by hand. It also then is something that has not one large ground mirror but it has a whole series of mirror segments that can be positioned and repositioned in order to keep that surface in order to focus the light and then it is not orbiting the earth but it is orbiting the sun in conjunction with the earth so it is what we call a lagrange point which is these points of gravitational equilibrium basically there are points behind in front of and trailing Earth as we go around the sun, and those points are stable with regard to the Earth-Sun system, which means you can orbit a vehicle around them. I don't pretend to be able to do the kind of math it would take to figure out how to orbit something around an empty point in space that's a uh, point of gravitational equilibrium, but it's been done multiple times and it's being done very successfully with the James Webb Space Telescope. And the kind of resolution that you're seeing from James Webb in the infrared spectrum really is allowing us to see through these clouds of dust in the galaxy and see through those two things that otherwise had been obscured to telescopes without this kind of resolution and detection. And so it is doing remarkable work for astronomy in terms of what we're able to see and how we're able to further understand things that had also been imaged by the Hubble. So James Webb Space Telescope is also being used as a part of what's called um, multi-mode astronomy, where you image the same place with different telescopes. And then by layering those images up or by comparing them, you can get to know a lot more about something than you would have from any one of those instruments independently. So James Webb Space Telescope is a remarkable piece of technology that really is enabling the kind of international collaboration and multi-mode astronomy that is cutting edge right now. It is a really exciting time to be working as a space historian, both for the number of changes that we have seen just in the last 10 years, which have fundamentally reshaped how human spaceflight, how planetary spaceflight, how astronomy is being done, but also for just looking at all of the changes in the commercial landscape of which different companies are a part of this and how many different nations are now a part of the space flight story, both human and planetary. So this is a really interesting time for this. And the question that I always get asked of what does the future look like for space flight is honestly not one that I can answer very easily. I'm fascinated to see all of these changes happening. It's interesting and I hope useful for the world to be uh, in the position to point out some of the historical antecedents for how we've gotten to where we are. But we're really seeing history written in front of us right now. 
and I wouldn't presume to make assumptions about where things are going to go. Mm 